morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us uh, at Assisi's Continuing Education. Today's topic is Home Alone and Freaked Out. Our presenter today is Dr. Jeff Nickel. Dr. Nickel did his undergraduate studies and graduate work at Michigan State University. He has been a veterinary hospital owner and practice general and behavior in medicine throughout his entire career. In 2015, Dr. Nickel completed his residency in behavior medicine through the American College of Veterinary Behaviors. His current practices are located in Albuquerque and Santa Fe, New Mexico, and is now limited to the diagnosis and treatment of behavior disorders of pets. Medical comorbidities are a common feature in his caseload. We welcome Dr. Nickel and thanks everybody and sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> well, the technical difficulties were at my end, but I, I think we're going to be fine. And I want to great. extend everybody my appreciation for coming. Um, as we all know, those of us who regard the behavior issues of pets to be significant, um, well, there are some pet parents who don't realize how important it is, and there are some of our colleagues who don't understand, but we can set an example. And I think that we can, we can do that by um, uh, just being aware of the realities of this thing. I mean, I think that um, if there's anybody here who is in attendance who doesn't know how to read, uh, let us know and I can read slides, but actually I'm not much of a slide reader because I think you can all interpret this kind of stuff. And what we're seeing in this one makes it pretty darn clear. By the way, CSA is canine separation anxiety. It makes it pretty clear that it's a little bit more common than otitis, which is the most common thing we see in general practice. Yet a whole lot of these things are going undiagnosed and untreated. And one of the biggest reasons for that is that some of our most committed pet parents the best clients sometimes don't even know their pet has separation anxiety. The common concept out there among many of us and, and our clients is that the dog with separation anxiety is the one who rips off the door frame and causes $1,500 worth of damage to the house every day. And these are the ones who are ripping the blinds off the windows and digging up the carpet and house soiling and just frantic when their people arrive home. Those dogs usually have separation anxiety, but there's an enormous cadre of them that um, are anxious and agitated. And I have a good video for you in a few minutes and they are really suffering. Um, and they go undiagnosed because even their committed pet parents don't know. The good news nowadays, just about everybody has a video camera in their pocket and we can dig, we can dig into those cases, but we'll get more of that in a little bit here. So the reality is, is that there is a whole lot of uh, anxiety out there um, in our species too. Um, <laughs> and you know how people are committed with their pets. I mean, let's face it, we are as well. Um, and uh, what affects the pet affects its person. We, uh, uh, we don't really use the term owner that much anymore. Yeah, we, we do own our pets. But the reality is that um, people get pretty wiggy when the pet is. And oftentimes the calls that come into my office from people whose pets are freaked out when they're away at work um, is that the people are just at wit's end. These are often the sweetest dogs. Those that are most closely bonded do anything for their person and yet the people can't deal with the destruction. Um, and so you can see here that it's a huge problem and anxiety in a broad sense, is a huge problem. And we're gonna talk about a treatment a little bit later that is approved for use uh, in the treatment of separation anxiety, but it's effective against pretty much any anxiety. We'll get to more of that. So uh, long lasting treatments, I mean, let's face it, everybody wants these things to be simple. Um, they're not. Um, <laughs> I have found that the more complex the problem that a pet parent brings to me, the more insistent they are that I solve it fast and simply for them. Um, and of course, part of our obligation to our clients is to communi uh, communicate, and we all know that. And we all know from general medicine that um, people often mention that behavior problem in the last 20 seconds of the regular routine exam, or maybe they came in for a, a skin problem or you know, dental issues or 
something else that's non-emergency. And they mentioned near the end of, of our time with them in the exam room, hey, by the way, this dog is tearing the house apart or seems pretty agitated when I get home. Well, I'll tell you the best thing for us to do, especially right now that people are at home and I, and I hope everybody has a way of communicating with their clients with social distancing and non-essential services being uh, put on the back burner. Um, if we have uh, newsletters, Facebook pages, social media of any kind that we can stay in touch with our clients until these restrictions are lifted. One of the things to ask is something that would be ideal if we asked every client every time we saw them in the exam room and that is how are things going behaviorally? Are there any issues that are causing your pet a problem? Well, you know, people have a home surveillance camera. You can send them a, a Dropbox link and they can shoot you a video of what the pet's doing while they're away. They may not recognize signs of, of anxiety, uh, but even if they don't have that, they can prop their smartphone up against a couple of books, aim it at the exit door and take off for 20 minutes. They need to drive away, but when they come back, they're gonna see what's going on with the pet and they can show that to you, upload that video and you can have a look. Um, we need to stop missing some of these cases because well, we're in this job to help these pets out. Um, but yeah, these are a lifelong challenge. You know, we all took this oath and, um, and I know we remember it. And, and this is why we got into this line of work, isn't it? The animal health and the welfare. And we think of welfare oftentimes you know, it's a pet that might be neglected. Rescue organizations take these dogs and cats in. Um, and they're doing God's work, prevention and the relief of animal suffering. But there's also the public health perspective on this thing. And when we think of that, of course, we, we feel we talk about zoonotic diseases. But here's something else that's zoonotic that involves this organ right here, the brain, uh, which by the way, is connected to just about every other physical system. Um, and it is a very physical organ. My, uh, my research project during my residency had to do with high resolution MRI scans of dogs who had died of uh, cognitive dysfunction. And we harvested their brains and we did histopath to uh, quantify beta amyloid plaques and, and relate that to their behavioral symptoms. This is all very physical stuff for me. And I can tell you that um, what goes on in that dog's brain and what directly affects its behavior has a direct effect on the behavioral health and well-being of the people in the home as well. And there's a lot of anxiety. We've all read about it right now during COVID-19 issues. And um, the pets aren't sensing that from their people. They're actually reading our body signals and they may be misinterpreting some of our human body language, but they're missing nothing. And yes, we're home with them. And if they have a smoldering separation anxiety problem, one that the pet parent might have been keeping sort of subclinical prior to coming home and staying home. Um, when they go back to work, this might be a problem and we'll get to that in a little bit as well. So let's, let's look at what we can do to serve uh, simply by asking a few more questions and encouraging people to send us a video. So what are the symptoms of anxiety that, well, we all probably are aware of these, but they're good to look at and, and maybe even send this list to our, to our clients so they can be aware of this and they can be really variable depending on the individual. Um, but you know, we can see this kind of stuff, slow motion movement, yawning. Sometimes you think, wasn't well, an anxious dog one is just agitated and kind of hyper running around the house? Um, not always. Um, they do things when they're anxious that they don't do when life is smooth and, and good and relaxed. It's a shift from their usual behavior. And, and then you can give people some of the typical symptoms. Um, you know, the, and, and these can be signs of anxiety that can be related to separation anxiety. Also other manifestations of anxiety. Um, separation anxiety is the topic of, of this webinar, but it certainly isn't the only one. And anxiety is really, really widespread in dogs. Um, Restless, sniffing, distracted, hypervigilant. You know, you'll see them scanning, looking back and forth, just doing things that are out of context. Um, hiding, freezing, this kind of stuff can be, you know, not hyper agitated, but it's not what they normally do, okay? So you can clue people into some of this stuff and they can 
be aware of it. So here is an interesting case that I handled not long ago. These folks drive up from El Paso because population is so sparse in the Southwest that, that I'm the closest credentialed behaviorist. So let me show you this video here. If I can, whoops, find, here we go. Um, you can see that there are three dogs here. You got the little fuzzy white guy, and then that great big Great Dane type of creature there who's, is, I mean, is he showing signs of anxiety? You know, I, rolling and rubbing and flopping over isn't really that abnormal. And then you got the fuzzy guy, probably a golden retriever sitting here on the couch. Doesn't look very anxious either. But look at this guy here. Nobody's home, but no humans are home. But he goes over and checks the door and he walks around and he sniffs and he scans a little bit and then, uh-oh, what's going on here? When they came to me, they weren't sure which dog was urine soiling and which dog was tearing stuff up around the house. How else are you gonna know but with video? Because they're not, they're not gonna rat each other out. So, I mean, this is a case where, um, boy, there's no substitute for video, okay? So why is this kind of stuff going on physiologically in the brain? And I never hesitate to remind my clients that the brain is a physical organ. Um, it's not some ethereal thing that just sort of happens and that we can't do anything about it. When you study neurology in veterinary school or you take those levels of, of uh, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, neuropathology during a residency, you really get focused on what's going on neurochemically in the synapses and, and behaviorally. I mean, what is, what is anxiety for? I mean, most of us have had it. Some of us have a significant problem with it, and we hate it, right? It's miserable, and it sometimes causes us to behave in ways that we wish we hadn't. Well, the reality is that it's normal because we're really evolutionarily developed, and so are our dogs and cats, to live in the wild and to be looking over our shoulder for that predator that might, you know, eat our lunch. And so we're supposed to be a little bit concerned about what might be lurking around that next corner but it's pathologic when it really impacts our lives. So anxiety, fear, not the same thing, but they're pretty closely related because fear, as much as anxiety can be well, chronic, it can be sustained um, with very little breaks depending on the environment and our perceptions or our dogs. Uh, fear, on the other hand, is very much in the moment. But if somebody is in a state of pretty significant anxiety, waiting for that other shoe to fall, and then something startles them, boom, they're, they've got a fear response now. So the physiology, physiology, I'm sorry, between these two things is very similar and is sort of a continuum when we have these as behavioral presentations. Um, so again, I don't think I need to read this slide to you, um, but this stuff's been worked out for a long time and there's nothing especially new about it, but we need to do something about this physically or we really have a hard, hard time. Um, we're gonna talk in a minute about the behavior modifications that can be really valuable in these things, but we need to deal with the underlying physiology or we're making it extremely hard for the pet to learn something new, a healthier alternative behavior. Because what we need for them to do is, let me put this a little differently. Many times people, they come to a behaviorist or sometimes a dog trainer and they say, I need to teach my dog to stop doing whatever. In this case, stop being freaked out, stop wrecking the house. Well, you don't teach anybody to stop doing something, especially when it is this deeply rooted in the physiology or pathophysiology of the brain. Instead, we need to change what's going on. If it's a severe case, we need to change what's going on because their brain is so overwhelmed with excitatory neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and glutamate that the prefrontal cortex, the thinking, rational, cognizant part of the brain is incapable of making other choices. It's overwhelmed. And you can see in this little diagram, the amygdala, it's on the, uh, on the right side is primarily where this problem is. Um, you know, the brain of course is not bilaterally symmetrical as much as it looks like it grossly neurochemically, it is quite specialized. So the amygdala is our, our organ, our target organ here. Um, and I think the takeaway from, from this slide is that 
we think of long-term memory storage in the hippocampus, certainly. It also happens in the cerebellum, and it happens in the amygdala, and it happens in the prefrontal cortex, and I could go on, but those are the big areas. And what's going on in the amygdala, when we have imprinted memories there, um, such as the dog observing its person, preparing to leave home, and then the ultimate disaster of seeing them walk out the door and then hearing the car disappear into the distance, those things trigger fear. And those are long-term memories. Now we can help that dog abandon those things and we can shift the physiology in the brain and we can give them healthier alternative behaviors and shift their expectation of what will happen as they see the owner getting ready to leave. But um, we absolutely must realize that the reason that many of these separation anxiety cases, uh, we all heave this big sigh of relief when our treatment makes a difference, the client's tickled with us, um, but what we don't necessarily recognize is that we may have toggled that dog from having been just a little bit above its threshold for loss of control when alone to just below its loss of threshold. It's a loss of control, I'm sorry, just below that threshold. And so what, what we're doing is we're not necessarily making a huge difference. Um, the symptoms are hugely different, but what's going on um, neurophysiologically in the brain isn't that much different. And partly the challenge is those long-term memories in the amygdala. They will come back and haunt us. And so it's essential with these cases to make clear to the client that I don't care how long this dog does great, we have never cured it and we must always maintain our management or we're going to have the problem again. And each time it relapses, it's more challenging to turn it around. I mean, these are tough cases and we need to do everything for them that we can. I don't have to tell you this dog's name, do I? These people were concerned that there was a problem because the dog was damaging the carpet. And so they created her, which is something that people do. And I am personally totally anti-crate because this dog has no choice of where she can be, what she can do. I often recommend people have a dog door installed among many changes so that at least the dog can have a change of venue. If it's freaked out inside, it can go outside. If it has storm phobia, which is often uh, comorbid with separation anxiety, they can come back in. But this dog is in a high state of distress and they don't necessarily know that when they come home. This wire crate, is heavy duty steel and this dog cannot bend it with her teeth and she's dug around on this foam rubber pad and it's in the same position when they come home. They don't know that the dog's been losing her mind until I encourage them to take this video. And boy, you really got their buy-in then when you're gonna start suggesting that we need to roll up our sleeves and get after this thing. It ain't going away by itself, okay? So permanent management changes. And I just drum that into people's heads. There is just no, no making this easy, sorry. So I, I explain to people what it means to ignore. And let me go off on that for just a minute if, if you'll indulge me. Dogs are a highly social species. They miss nothing with their leaders, largely because they are certain that they have no entitlements as our subordinates. In other words, other than air to breathe and water to drink, they do not have a right to attention from their leader, food, shelter, uh, love. In their minds, in their canine brains, those are all resources that their benevolent leader will award them if they are earned. And that's really an essential point because a dog re regards any response from its leader as a reinforcer, a validation of its behavior and of its emotional state of the moment. Now, here's why that's so important is because dogs live in the moment much better than we do. Um, we can take a lesson from that. Um, but that people, you know, we humans, we know something about body language between us. You know, you cross your arms, you lean back, you know, whatever. We've all studied those things. But dogs are total experts on it because in a canine social group, whether it's domestic or feral, they're swapping information almost continually, even when they're half asleep. And they look to their human leaders, believing that their person understands all of that and that the person's body signals, however subtle, however unintentional, however unaware the person is 
that they're sending those signals, the dog is sure that the person is deliberately communicating with them. You know, hence the dog picking up on our anxiety. Dog doesn't pick it up, it reads it. And they don't misinterpret a lot of our body signaling. So if your client is gonna get successful with this, and this is one of those essential points of managing separation anxiety in dogs, is that you don't validate the dog's agitation and anxiety as it watches its person prepare to leave home. Dogs are really big on predictors. One event predicts the next. And they know because they've seen this happen hundreds, if not thousands of times, as the person goes through their morning ritual of preparing to get ready and go to work, um, the dog's anxiety ratchets up another level with each successive step that, they, that their person takes in the inexorable direction of leaving them alone. And so people gotta go to work, or at least they're gonna have to pretty soon. And what they absolutely must do is not inadvertently validate the dog's uh, belief that is getting reinforced for being anxious. So if the dog is getting a response from its leader while the dog is anxious, the dog believes that the leader actually wants more of that. And we need to get out of our human brains when dealing with these cases. And we need to make clear to people that you are very much encouraged to love your dog and cat like little people in furry suits, but they're members of a different species. And some of the rules are very different and dogs do not understand that when we squat down and kiss and hug them before leaving that when we say, you're gonna be fine, try to be relaxed today, try not to do another $1,500 worth of damage to the house. The dog is believing that their anxiety has just been validated. So total ignoring of the dog who does not exist is absolutely essential. They really can't succeed any other way. So drum that home to them, which by the way, you really can't do in that last 30 seconds of an exam appointment. You need to schedule a behavior appointment, at least an hour and charge for it, please because they will value your service in direct proportion to how much they had to sacrifice to get it. Um, so don't give any, don't, if, if you give stuff away, by the way, um, something like this, uh, you're not helping your client, you're wasting your time. So um, ignoring, exercise matters, um, exertion, uh, there's actually serotonin, the neurotransmitter that helps reduce anxiety, is produced not just in the brain and the gut, but in the skeletal muscles. And so heavy exertion, heavy exercise prior to an event that might trigger the dog's anxiety, like seeing its person leave, um, that will help reduce anxiety. So heavy exercise in the morning, if you can get people to do it with their dog. Um, and uh, the other thing, by the way, is um, something that they can do uh, that species or maybe breed typical, like if it's a retriever, throw the ball, something like that. Okay, um, and no morning meal feeding before the person leaves for work. Instead, they load the, um, the dog's daily ration into food dispensing toys and puzzles. There's lots of them. Let me just show you one of my favorites. This one's called the Twist and Treat. Uh, you can get it from Pet Safe. You can put dry or canned food in it. I like to suggest people put canned food in these things. And then uh, initially they can make it easy for the dog to scavenge as they would from carrion in the wild, which is primarily how they subsist. Um, and ultimately, as they get a little bit more skilled at manipulating this funky shaped thing and pulling it apart so they can get the food, they put canned food in it, stick it in a Ziploc, freeze it overnight, and in the morning, they take it out of the Ziploc and drop it on the floor as they walk out the door, leaving behind the dog who has been fully ignored and doesn't even exist, they're such a good ignorer, and the dog says, gee whiz, am I hungry? And I'm a dog. And naturally, the healthy, appropriate, species-typical uh, behavioral stress is foraging and hoping to survive another day. Well, and, and here's, a, here's a bit of roadkill. I better get started. Uh, you can hide those under furniture, beneath sofa cushions. Uh, the dog has to find a way to survive, focusing their brain on doing what's natural for their species. Not just a good tip, that kind of thing can be essential. And so if they drop them on the floor when they leave and pick them up on the way, uh, when they return home and they've left out enough different ones that they can rotate each day, then the dog can learn that, wow, when I see my person getting ready to leave, that means I get an opportunity to be a dog and survive. And so their attitude can shift from, 
oh my goodness, I'm never going to get out alive to, uh, here's your hat, I think I hear the bus, uh, time for you to go to work so I can get about the business of doing what I must to get through another day, which is what they're supposed to be doing. So yeah, pick it up on the way back in the door so it's associated with you being gone. Ideally, I like to uh, convince my clients to stop feeding from a bowl, do it all from food toys and puzzles. And video monitoring, hugely important. We can, we can implement a variety of treatments and the dog is better, but can we get the very most peaceful, relaxed, healthy life for that dog that we possibly can, can do? You bet we can. And if you have that client video monitor, even after the dog is better, maybe we can do a little better, okay? So behavior modifications, these are the foundation pieces. These have been shifted and adjusted over time with research and experience. Um, you know, desensitizing the dog to uh, its recognition of pre-departure cues, such things as, you know, picking up the car keys, you know, putting on your shoes, the jacket, the purse. Uh, these are actions that many pet parents are gonna take as they get ready to leave. Um, they're different for each dog. The one dog might say, gosh, you're putting on your shoes. Now I'm gonna lose my mind. Another dog, dog might say, oh my goodness, you picked up your keys. Now it's time for me to freak out. You know, they, they try to do these actions repetitively while they're at home so that the dog goes, okay, I guess that doesn't mean much. These things can be helpful. Uh, the counter conditioning element is that when the dog calms down, they tell the dog it's good, catch it doing something right, which is like being calm. Um, that's, that's valuable stuff to do. But by itself, it isn't going to put much of a dent in the problem. Independence training, uh, that's when you know these hyper-attached, super-bonded dogs like Velcro, and people can't leave them alone around the house. Um, so they try to keep the dog occupied at increasing distances from them. It can be somewhat helpful. Uh, it used to be believed that separation anxiety and overbonding were part of the same package. Turns out that they're not, although very commonly they're they coexist. Um, and then the graduated absence is kind of the old standby. About the only use I have for that in my clinical cases is for dogs where I'm wanting to monitor just how well they're doing um, during treatment. Um, how long can the owner be gone? Um, and, uh, and what's the dog doing while they're away? Um, boy, it just helps us to manage the case. Um, drugs have been considered essential to the treatment of these. Because again, we have to shift the body, the, uh, the neurochemistry or the function of the neurons um, if we're going to help this dog be set up to succeed and learn healthier alternative behaviors. Um, very often I see folks uh, prescribe trazodone uh, as a sole agent. It generally is not as good as a different primary anxiolytic like an SSRI fluoxetine. Certainly is a very good choice for many. Uh, the veterinary brand Reconcile is chewable. It is made in America. It's reliable. Um, you can't always say that for the generics. Um, so I like uh, fluoxetine. Uh, clomipramine under the brand name Clomacom, been around for quite a while. Uh, it's pretty darn good too, but on bigger dogs, it can get kind of expensive because we have learned that we need to use it at significantly higher doses than what's in the insert and what the, uh, what was used as research uh, when it was approved uh, for this indication. And we use it twice daily in most cases. Um, and then very often we'll add on the trazodone as a as needed anxiolytic. Uh, theoretically, it could risk serotonin syndrome in these dogs. In a practical sense, it just doesn't happen. Um, it is serotonergic. It, it is uh, a part of neither the SSRI nor the TCA class. Um, it, it, uh, uh, potentiate serotonin by different pathways, and uh, we don't have a problem with it, and it's mighty safe stuff. Uh, at higher doses, it, it also carries some sedation, which is not an altogether bad thing when, when the pet parent is gone. And of course, then there are benzodiazepines. There's a whole bunch of those. Um, they can, they, most of them are pretty short acting, like a few hours. Uh, clonazepam, clonazepam, pardon me, um, is uh, somewhat longer acting. Uh, not terribly ex expensive like chlorazepate is. Clonazepam works well for some of these. And in fact, I would not combine an SSRI with a tricyclic like uh, fluoxetine and clomipramine, but you can certainly 
use one of those as a primary anxiolytic and add in trazodone. And if you need to, a benzodiazepine on top of that. You gotta be a little careful with these things. But again, video monitoring can tell you how you're doing. Um, and drugs really can make a very big difference. And I'll tell you, for the tough cases, we have to use everything at our disposal, but now we have something new. And this is really exciting because it doesn't rely on drugs. That's part of what makes it exciting, which can be a very big selling feature for it if you have a client who absolutely won't use medication. Sometimes these are folks who have been prescribed psychotropics for themselves or someone close to them, and they've had side effects and they weren't happy. I point out to my clients that side effects are never acceptable, and we need to change medications or change dosages if we have them. Um, and sometimes you need to add them to the uh, targeted pulse electromagnetic field device, uh, the calmer canine, but you can use the calmer canine by itself. You still want to do ignoring. You still want to give that dog food toys. You still want to keep that dog out of the crate from fracturing its canine teeth and cutting its lips and breaking its nails and losing its mind. Um, but you, uh, this calmer canine is pretty slick because it adjusts what's going on in the microglia of the amygdala. And it's targeted because you can see this little outfit that this dog is wearing. It's a two-piece thing. Uh, you don't have to have it. I'll show you a picture in a minute. But there's one part that goes around the dog's neck and then the other part around its anterior chest with a little strap that connects the two. And um, here in this next photograph, or here, this photograph, there you go, you can see in the lower left corner of this uh, iris setter, that's where the Velcro pad is. And then in the lower right corner, the halo-shaped device um, that puts out a pulsed electromagnetic field that targets the amygdala. That's got a little Velcro kind of thing on the back and you just stick it to that. And um, the dog just wears it like the dog in the upper right corner. You can see the, the folks in the upper left corner, that person with that small dog is holding the, uh, the calmer canine device. We can do that. But you know, these are twice daily, 15 minute long treatments. It uh, turns itself off. Um, and uh, you know, you want to hold that darn thing? This little thing called a vest, it costs like an extra $25, I think, something like that. It's not much. And uh, people can snuggle up with their dog twice a day. And uh, the dog just sits there and gets these treatments. Um, they go on for, uh, you know, 15 minutes and the thing shuts itself off. Um, most dogs will improve four to six weeks, what they call one course of treatment. But there are many who've done well in just two weeks. Um, back to medications for a minute. Um, you know, many people are so desperate. I want them to have something right away. And I'll start them on an SSRI. I'll add in trazodone as needed right from the get-go. And I'll start the calmer canine. And those cases who do really, really well, I might just want to start tapering down medications that may not be needed. Now, let me back up a slide. This is how this thing works. Um, nitric oxide, uh, that's the uh, that's the NO. Um, th this is actually an inflammatory response. MRI scans on people who have had severe anxiety problems, their amygdala is actually measurably bigger than it is in the normal individual. And when their anxiety is significantly improved on follow-up MRIs, it comes back closer to normal, but never quite to normal because there's always going to be too much going on in that little organ than than there should be. And so this is, a, we're, we're, we're shifting what's going on in the brain. We bind calcium to calmidulin, uh, calmidulin and that triggers the production of nitric oxide. Uh, not only reduces anti-inflammatory uh, uh, mediators, but potentiates anti-inflammatory mediators, and it helps to generate more uh, dopamine the feel-good uh, neurotransmitter, serotonin, the one that reduces anxiety, and endorphins. So they get the runner's high. Um, and so, you know, even, even the device, the, the, uh, the calmer canine, actually does things in multiple ways. And a multimodal treatment approach that is tailored to the individual that's how you reach success with these things. Um, you'll do much better with these cases by um, treating them as individuals. And again, the videos are huge. So here's the story of Keita. 
um, she's a, you know, these folks took her on as a rescue and, uh, you know, she was just wigged out. And like so many people, they tried crating her. Um, and, you know, so the crate didn't uh, work very well because the dog kept escaping it. And you see videos of dogs tearing through these. The adrenaline gives them super strength. And so they use zip ties to prevent the dog from getting out of it. Um, you know, there was a much longer story to this. They even invested in one of these very expensive crates. You can get them on the internet. Oh, they're like a vault. The dog can't get out and the dog is just freaked out. It is not in the dog's uh, best interest to be uh, incarcerated on these things. Um, so this person found out that there was a clinical research project on the Comer canine and, uh, and jumped in. So you can see that in this dog in just a couple of weeks uh, was noticeably better. And people like it because it's easy. Um, you know, you just put the, uh, put the little vest on the dog and you stick this thing behind its head and you sit there with her for, you know, a couple of 15-minute uh, treatments, morning and evening. Not much to it. Hey, here's another story that um, I like this one a lot, a little pixel, um, because this dog had multiple other kinds of anxieties. It had noise phobias, which are, again are uh, largely genetic in their genesis. This has been well researched. And by the way, uh, separation anxiety is often genetic in its origin, although lots of environmental factors are, uh, are certainly involved. We see more separation anxiety, for example, in dogs who've been in shelters. They're more prone to have that. Um, and, uh, but the genetic predisposition for it is certainly a big factor as, as it is for the distinct but often comorbid disorder of of noise phobia. Um, and that's what, and, and then you get other dogs like this who are afraid of lots of stuff like slick floors, a ceiling fan, uh, you know, the sound of rain and wind. Here in Albuquerque, we have uh, hot air balloons, we have the annual balloon fiesta, and it causes a lot of dogs to just freak out. So, um, you know, individuals, they have reasons to, to lose their mind. And so <laughs> this poor dog, um, you know, this was off label. Um, it's valuable to tell clients that. Um, I know that there's a legal requirement as well, but also um, sometimes people think that you don't read the instructions yourself if you prescribe a treatment and it says right on the label, this is for separation anxiety. Doctor, my dog doesn't have that. It, it freaks out with the wind and the rain and the, and the hailstorms. and you go, well, okay, I should have told you that this is an off label use, which is totally legitimate as long as I tell you first. So tell them first. And they all nod their head and they go, well, you know what the heck you're doing, don't you? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, we do. So here's the, the issue that, that um, right now I think we can get ahead of. Again, it, unfortunately, we're not seeing many of our clients in the exam room and, and we're not observing their pets the way we'd like to. But in my behavior practice, I, I don't do general medicine anymore. I don't see hit by cars. Um, and I don't do a lot of, um, uh, you know, I don't do cancer treatments and type, treat diabetes and, and fix fractures, but I, uh, I only treat behavior cases. But I can tell you that uh, from all those years of experience, um, communication really matters. And so if you can't see the pet and you can't see the client directly, um, we can do uh, Facebook Lives. I know a lot of practices are doing those. I know that a lot of people are doing uh, video consultations with their clients uh, just to follow up on things and for them to send you videos and talk to them about this and put this out in your social media, uh, um, social media methods that you're using. That if you say to people, look, your dog may have been struggling with some level of separation anxiety and wouldn't have been any way for you to know until after having been home with that dog consistently for several weeks or longer, and then you go back to work full time away from home, then this thing may rear its ugly head. And again, once these things relapse, it's exceptionally hard to get them back under control. And so staying ahead of this thing really, really matters. So videos, they make a trial absence and they need to go through their, their usual routine of getting ready to go just as though they really were going somewhere, you know, like you know, taking their shower and getting dressed and doing their hair and, and uh, you know, getting all their stuff together. And uh, 
They can certainly drop food toys on the floor and they absolutely must ignore completely. I'm, I didn't say ignore the dog because they're such world-class ignorers that they don't have one of those. And they walk out the door after having set up, you know, aim their, their smartphone or, you know, there are real-time apps that you can get whether you get a Nest Cam system, N-E-S-T, Nest Cam. You can get them online for $99. You get two cameras and an app for the smartphone so they can see what the dog's doing after they've driven three blocks away and parked. And then they can say, gee, maybe there is a problem. And if they get started with a Commer K9 now, by the time they go back to work in two weeks, four weeks, whenever we get lucky on this thing, this thing is already starting to make a difference. And they can also be having set into motion um, that management changes that need to be permanent, you know, the ignoring, the food toys, all that type of stuff. So we want to, you know, prevent these pets from causing us huge headaches and diminishing their welfare and the well-being of their people. Um, and, you know, let's face it, people, a lot of them are facing financial hardships through this thing. And uh, physical damage to the home is not going to help. Separation anxiety is a huge cause of people surrendering their pets to shelters. It breaks their heart. And if they have children who are in their young lives learning about relationships and how to work through them um, and how to be loyal and committed and, and deal with issues, and then they relinquish the pet, this is just tragic, not to mention what it does to the dog. So I'm a believer in Let's find out which of our patients have this. You know, people are at home, they wanna make sure there isn't a problem. Many of them have an inkling that there's a problem because their dog is one that follows them around the house all the time or they put it out in the yard and it cries at the door. Or they go out in the yard and leave the dog inside and it cries at the door. Um, they have a suspicion that their dog has a problem or it may have other anxieties, which, again, may not be separation related, but could benefit from proactive reduction in the dog's anxiety um, using the calmer canine. Um, and so let's find those cases. Uh, yeah, there's pretty darn good research on this thing. A lot of it uh, we acknowledge is taken from the human side. Uh, they're using uh, pulse electromagnetic fields and, and uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation and many really uh, resistant uh, refractory cases on the human side. But uh, we do have one very good pilot study and another much deeper, bigger study is underway right now at North Carolina State. But the published study so far, um, and I can vouch for its uh, validity, the uh, Dr. Margaret Gruen, the researcher who did it, was a resident with me. Um, and so I know Margaret and I know her work and, and uh, she's a researcher. She's not a clinician like I am. She's out there doing the heavy lifting for the rest of us. And so you can see from uh, the basics of this thing that, um, you know, they saw real results. But of course, like any good research project, you have to point out, well, these are possible confounding factors, such as caregiver placebo effect. Well, if you've read much research, or maybe you've done some of your own, uh, you may be a believer in the value of the placebo effect. Uh, I know I am. Uh, I know that, yeah, when you've got a dog who's got reason to be anxious right now in the moment, and its person is fawning over it or trying to talk it out of being anxious, that can validate the anxiety. But twice daily, that physical contact, which of course triggers oxytocin release for the pet and its person, everybody starts calming down and the dog takes that away from its person. And the physical contact is a wonderful reinforcer for the dog being calm in that moment. So twice daily, this dog's sitting here with the calmer canine, this little halo type thing on its, right behind its head, very comfortable, sitting with its person. Do you think that helps? I think that helps. I don't know how to measure that, but you know, we're, we're serving everybody's well-being on this thing. And, um, you know, not to dump on medications because they certainly can have their place depending on the case, but you give a pill, this isn't part of it. But when you have the calmer canine on the pet, uh, everybody feels better. So 
Yeah, it's revolutionary. And I think this kind of thing is here to stay. Um, Assisi Animal Health also produces what's called the Assisi Loop. And um, that's for inflammatory problems and not just in joints, although in horses it is where it's been used the longest. Um, I have used an Assisi Loop on my own dog, my 12-year-old Border Collie. Um, she's got some degenerative joint changes. Uh, does very well, but recently, you know, she plays with a younger dog sometimes, and uh, you know, her wrist, her left carpus, uh, becomes a problem. And um, we use the uh, Assisi Loop twice a day for 15 minutes on that, and it really makes a difference. She's got some uh, uh, slightly worrisome liver enzymes recently, and so I'm really trying to avoid the non-steroidals, and so the Assisi Loop is a is a wonderful alternative to that. Um, Anyway, they're made by the same company. They use different frequencies. They have different purposes altogether. You don't mix them up, but um, you know, Assisi's offering special pricing on that stuff right now. And um, with the uh, Commer K9 in particular, if you have your, uh, well, let me back up a step if I might. Your client will need a prescription from you in order to order the Assisi loop um, because it's important for them to have a real honest to goodness diagnosis. But they can order online at the Commer K9 website, that's C A L M E R, the letter K, and then the number nine, commerk9.com. Uh, they can take a quiz, which um, really helps them recognize the symptoms that they might not have been fully understanding, behavioral signs. And if they order one, they can not only get it right now at the discounted price, and they need to put your name in the uh, veterinary box, the veterinarian box, but there's a coupon code box. And if you have them put my first name, Jeff, they don't know me from Adam, but if they put Jeff in there, they will get an additional 15% off. So it's discounted and then put my first name in the coupon code box and it's even cheaper. Uh, they're welcome to call the CZ and uh, get their questions answered. So are you for that matter. Um, but if you wanna keep these things on hand, there's special pricing for that. And there's special pricing for the, um, for the clients too. So that's pretty much all the pontificating I have for now, but I'm open to questions. And um, I, uh, I've done a lot of this um, and I hope that I can answer pretty much any question that you have. And if I go to- No, I'll, I'll feed you the questions if you'd like. Okay, that sounds good, Carolyn, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, question number one, have you seen any connection between separation anxiety and dominance aggression? Uh, no, however, um, anxiety is such a widely pervasive disorder in dogs and many times people make the mistake. It's, I'm not saying it's a mistake to have more than one dog. It's a mistake to combine some dogs with other dogs though. And you know, how do people know? And they love dogs, so they have one and they're happy, they want more. And the problem is that we live in buildings, like a house, with walls and doors and windows, and we have fences outside our yard, all of which are contrivances for dogs. These are what we call artificial barriers. And very often, dogs in a group, and by the way, the most common behavior disorder we see in a specialty practice is aggression between family dogs. It's huge. And there can be multiple, multiple factors, but one of the more common ones is that somebody gets stuck in a corner and would love to escape or avoid the other dog. And if they lived feral and there were no restrictions like walls and fences, they could create all the distance that they need to, but they're stuck. And so the, the higher status dog or sometimes the lower status dog who's highly frightened um, and defensive aggressive uh, can trap the other dog. And that can be very easily misinterpreted as dominance aggression. Now, we see dominance aggression for sure. Um, and so you have to kind of pick that stuff apart. And a detailed history is essential. Videos, we never suggest somebody take a video of their dogs fighting. Uh, we don't want to set them up for that, obviously. But I like to have people take some video, just a few minutes, of the dogs near each other. Um, sometimes with leashes that they're, each one is dragging in case something goes sideways, they can separate them. Um, but yeah, dominance aggression certainly can, is a big factor in many of these. Um, but anxiety is the reason why they're, 
Well, they could get along maybe if they were part of the same social group, if they didn't have human contrivances foisted on them, like walls and you know corners of rooms and furniture that they can't get around. And uh, yes, anxiety can certainly play a part in that. And those same dogs can have separation anxiety because the underlying anxiety can be manifest in two different ways. They can have political problems with, with a dog and they can be predisposed genetically to separation anxiety. And so consequently, you've got a dog who um, is, uh, yeah, it's, it's aggression problems with the other household dog could benefit as much from the common canine as the separation anxiety does. Um, and other management and behavior modification methods that are outside the scope of this meeting. But um, yeah, oftentimes anxiety is involved in all of that stuff. And some of the foundational treatments are going to be similar, such as the calmer canine, and in some cases, medications like an SSRI. Okay, uh, can be helpful. question number two. Yes, ma'am. What do you do about food toys when there are multiple dogs who may uh, food slash treat, guard, or fight? That is a really valuable question because food-related aggression is such a common problem. Um, and yeah, if you're going to recommend something like a food toy in the person's absence, you, you sure need to ask that question. Um, interestingly, as highly social as dogs are, it's only a pretty unusual one where people have one solitary dog with separation anxiety, and they add another dog, and they become fast friends and the original dog has no longer got a separation anxiety problem because he has a companion. That's really unusual. Um, and many people have made that mistake and they've gotten the second dog and now they've still got the same problem. Um, and then they've got things like, like food related aggression. So my point in, in this is that again, if you take video or have the client take videos and see what the dogs are like, no food toys when they're together and the person is gone. And then, put the dog with separation anxiety away from the other dog, give it as much space as possible and put the behaviorally normal dog some other place. Does the, does the dog with separation anxiety behave the same when the other dog is near it or differently? If you saw that video I showed with those two big dogs and that little fuzzy white guy, I think he was a Bichon, um, he didn't care that the other dogs were there. He was anxious regardless. So if you establish that that's the case, and it very likely is that the dog with separation and anxiety does not relate to his, his besties when he's home alone because he's too freaked out, then he doesn't need to be with them when this person is gone. And, and he can have his own space with food toys while the other dogs are elsewhere. So valuable question, thank you for that one. Okay, and next, uh, can I use the Assisi loop and the calmer canine in the same patient? Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, you would not use an Assisi loop on the dog's brain any more than you would use a calmer canine on, in the case of my border collie, on, on her carpus. <laughs> and yeah, you could. Now, is it smart to use them at the same time? And I don't believe that is known. And as much as these things are targeted, who the heck needs all those electromagnetic fields that might cancel each other out, for example? And so, to that, I would say I'm perfectly happy with that, but at different times. I would turn one off and then turn the other one on. Perfect. Would this work for thunderstorm anxiety, which is just intermittent and not permanent? You know, that has been done. And in fact, this case that um, I showed a few slides back, this dog right here, Pixel, um, yeah, those, of course, by, by definition are intermittent problems. And I certainly would do that. And I would do that in part because, yes, there are dogs who have serious phobias of, of these uh, noisy events, for example. And, and phobias are a distinct class of behavior disorders, but their, their basis is in anxiety. Um, and so we are making changes in the microglia of the dog's brain in its amygdala with the use of the calmer canine. And the best time to use it would be not during storm season. And then as storm season approaches, put it back into place. Different dogs are going to require a different length in their first course of treatment. Usually it's four to six weeks. Most of them are significantly better. Not everybody, like 
every other treatment we have. Not every case is a success. But if it is a success, which it is likely to be, and we get the, um, uh, and we get an improvement, and then storm season approaches, I would reinstitute twice daily treatments and stay ahead of it. Uh, you know, there may be some cases that would uh, benefit from every single day, twice a day, 365 days a year. Probably not necessary, but you can safely give this as much as you want to. Um, it's a perfectly legitimate treatment, um, but twice a day is, is what it's meant for. Are there any studies or use in cats for FLUTD? Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, these have been used off-label in cats. I am not advocating that, uh, in part because we don't have any research on it. And the, the focal distance between the electromagnetic field generator in the Comrade canine device, the distance between that and the cat's amygdala is much shorter than in a dog. And so we don't, we don't know if that's safe. We don't know if the frequency would necessarily be different. To my knowledge, there are no cases of any disasters, but you know, to the issue of feline lower urinary tract disease, or what's often been called uh, feline idiopathic cystitis, which is those physical pathologic bladder wall changes that are completely a result of chronic stress, uh, often in crowded households without enough environmental enrichments, frankly, barren environments for some of these cats that in the homes of loving people who just don't know any better. Um, you know, reducing anxiety neurochemically would is really valuable. And frankly, we prescribe medications in many of these cases, in addition to the environmental improvements. Um, I would love to have a calmer feline device. And, um, you know, there's no official word on it, but I think knowing the CZ Animal Health, I'm betting that uh, that's on the plan because uh, it would be enormous if we could do that. I would love it. <laughs> okay, I'll remind them. <laughs> yeah, good. Pass that along. I will. Put my vote on that one, Carolyn. Thank okay. You. Um, let's uh, think that perhaps we have one more question left. And for those that are not answered yet, uh, when we close up, we will certainly take your questions and see that you get either an answer from a CC if it's a CC related, or they will be pushed directly to Dr. Nickel to answer as well. So here's a last. Do nutraceuticals such as Zycline have any place in treatment of separation anxiety? I think they do. Zilkine is a hydrolyzed milk protein made by casein from cow's milk. It's a, the chemical name is alpha-cazazepine. It is totally safe, comes in a capsule. You open the capsule and put the powder on the pet's food. It is palatable to everybody. It is GABAergic, which of course is what we get with benzodiazepines like clonazepam or alprazolam or diazepam or lorazepam or any of those. Um, it can be helpful, but people are asking too much of a nutraceutical like that or anxetane, which is L-theanine, uh, for these really severe cases. It is not going to be helpful. People say, oh, I've tried everything. I've used pheromones like Adaptal, which by the way is a, another helpful treatment that I will add into these. Um, you can add zilkine or anxetane to um, pharmaceuticals, anxiolytics. You can add it to the Comra canine. I think for pretty significantly symptomatic dogs, it can be a very helpful add-on. But if the problem is very, very mild, those can be helpful, uh, those nutraceuticals as a sole treatment but um, otherwise, uh, no, <laughs> they just don't have the potency to get the job done. 